Hi guys, and welcome to Super Bowl Sunday, which if you didn't know, is the pinnacle of the NFL season, the National Football League season in the US. So I'm gonna to refer to it as American football or football just as it comes out, but obviously over here, it's just football and everywhere else it's American football. So some fun facts about today, Super Bowl Sunday, is 1.33 billion chicken wings will be eaten. So not such a great fun fact if you're a chicken, but I did work out just for you that if you stretch the chicken wings back to back, it would stretch two and a half times around the earth. True story. Also other fun facts, for people who aren't into football, then the halftime show is kind of like the pinnacle. So this year's Lady Gaga, they've had, I think they had like um, Beyonce and Katy Perry and all those fun people. And people will sit around telling you that it's just not as good as it used to be in the days of old. And that's also true for the most ridiculously expensive ads which will run today. And people will also sit around saying about how crap they are. But usually there's one or two really, really great ones. And that's what people are sitting around waiting to watch. So for the non-football fans, halftime is where it's at. For the football fans, it's all about the game. And for a third group of people, there's something called the Puppy Bowl, where you can watch puppies playing, pretending to play some version of football. And so that proves that the internet is not the only place that you can watch dogs for hours and hours and hours. Now, the astute of you will notice that I am wearing a uh, Buccaneers hat, so Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I now live in Tampa, Florida. I've lived in a lot of places, so I have some garb from all over. But the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are my local team. The uh, Buccaneers are pirates, and so they actually have like a mock pirate ship at one end of the station. And when they score a touchdown, then uh, cannons go off. Currently not that great a team, bit of transition rebuilding time, so not that much cannon shooting right now. But all the teams have their own mascots, they have, you know, some kind of fanfare, and it's all part of the pomp and ceremony of what is, after all, a very long one-hour game. So next I'm going to try to ask and answer some of the questions that I had when I started watching American football, and I still really don't get all of it, to be fair, because it's so much strategy. But here are some of the things that I think you might have questions about that I might have some answers for. So here we go. Who are the most hated teams? Well, the most hated team, as done by a recent report, are the New England Patriots. So I have spent time in Boston. We lived in Boston. My husband's family are from Boston. So I am a Patriots fan, except that it's fine, really. So they are the most hated because they are actually the winningest team in the NFL of recent times. Winningest, yes, it's a real word, look it up. So as any team who is phenomenal um, often is, they are hated with a vengeance by non-Patriots fans. And I will tell you, the thing about Boston fans is they can be a little obnoxious. I don't think I'm one of those, but it can be a little obnoxious, but it's a great, great sporting town. And just to show you, um, this is like a baseball cap I have. This is um, another Boston hat, the Celtics. So if you go into Boston, you will see people wearing this stuff all the time, everywhere. Huge, huge fans of their team. Used to be big losers, now big winners. So they kind of have a bit of gloat going on. Now, the other people who are haters will tell you that Bill Belichick is Darth Vader and the Patriots are <laughs> the Death Star. So you can see there's a lot of fun folklore that goes with that. Um, but they're kind of like Liverpool with Dalgleish and Bob Hazley. So, you know, that kind of level of winning definitely doesn't um, in, you know, kind of make them uh, the most loved team of all time, for sure. But uh, Brady is going to go down as probably the best quarterback. And what else can I tell you about them? OK, so the other thing about the Patriots is that they um, sometimes bend the rules a little and they are sometimes accused of trickeration. Also a word, by the way. Love it, right? So then who else are not liked that much? I'll tell you the second team, most hated team, as rated in a recent survey are... The Cowboys. So this is an old shirt from uh, that Michael picked up for a favorite player that he had, in fact. So uh, Cowboys are known as America's team. I'm not 100% sure how they got that name, but it's definitely stuck. And people love to hate the Cowboys. It's really unclear to me why, actually, but they do. And you'll often hear people say, I'm cheering for my team 
always, and then always cheering for the team that are playing the Cowboys. So I don't know why it is, it just is. I will tell you they had a phenomenal year, great team right now, and they were a little unlucky to make it to the Super Bowl. So um, those are the top two most disliked teams in the NFL. So where might you consider getting life insurance if you decide to go to a home game? And the answer is quite simply, the Oakland Raiders. This is a much beloved, very old sweatshirt of my husband's. And I would tell you probably about 30% of the time he wears it out, there is some Raiders fan who feels the need to come up and shake his hand, fist pump his hand, or slow down the car, roll down the window and yell, go Raiders! They are a very loyal fan base that um, stadium's called, they call the stadium the Black Hole. They, I mean, it's not that you will get stabbed, shanked if you go watch a game but it's not like these things haven't happened either so you definitely want to be on the inside of that club not on the outside <laughs> but I will tell you if you look at pictures of them like they're all dressed up they're covered in face paint like they are the most rabid fans which is great if you're just watching the games I'm not sure I'd recommend actually going to a home game especially if you're not wearing Raiders gear point taken I think so that's the piece about race that I think you probably need to know more than anything else. Next question. Why does it take so long to play a one hour game? This drives me batty. It's one hour. It's 60 minutes of game split over four quarters, 15 minutes each. How can it possibly take three hours on average, actually a little over three hours on average to play this game? And the answer is actually pretty simple. It's broken into ad breaks, millions and millions of ad breaks. I think somebody said there are like 100 commercials in a football game. The second answer is that they stop the clock for everything. So there are seven referees, and at any given time, if they throw a flag, or if somebody runs out of bounds, or there's a touchdown, or a change of um, possession, all of these things involve a whistle, a stopping of the clock, and then everybody has to reset, restart, go from there. So there's something called the two minute drill, so at the end of each of the quarters, there's a two minute warning. So at two minutes, they stop the game. Then everybody goes off, huddles up, and they have a two minute drill. So that two minutes, it's kind of like waiting for the train in an underground station. It says two minutes on the board, but you don't really know because it's not really two consecutive minutes with the train on the move. That can be at seven minutes. And I'll tell you that most of the scoring happens in those two minutes because they are at that point ready to implement some serious strategy based on what's happened on the rest of the game and all the um, practices and coaching and whatever else. So the two minutes, I've, I've always said, I really almost could watch just four two-minute pieces of those games, but it takes forever. Um, marvels of modern technology is you can watch the game without the ads, but not in real time. So you have to pick your poison on that one. So sorry, guys, I completely appreciate it. It's a ridiculously long game but no end in sight on that because with the concussion protocol, with the um, challenges, all of that stuff just stops the game and then you have to start again. So with that, let's talk about the referees. Seven referees, a guy, there's also a guy watching four concussions that's not related to the league at all. And then you also have review booths and you have the guys who actually get, go look and review themselves, the referees, have some automatic reviews if there's a scoring play. The coaches can throw out a challenge, which means things can get reviewed, but they can't challenge everything. Uh, it's not that complicated, but I don't understand all of those pieces. All that to say that we're still sitting on the sofa or in the stands complaining about the crap refereeing. That does not change in any game, in any sport, anywhere in the world. We all think the refs are deaf and blind. So no difference there between any kind of football. Oh, and I will say that even something as simple as what seems to be a catch is a giant mess of rules. So when you don't know whether a catch is a catch, that's when you have referees discussing whether to blow, they blow the whistle to have a discussion about whether it was a catch or not a catch, what they should do next. I know, a catch is not a catch sometimes. Mm -hmm. Another of the questions I had when I started watching was, who are they talking to on the headsets? I don't know any British sports where you can talk to somebody via a headset, helmet to helmet. So the answer is they can talk to the quarterback or the head of the defense 
Um, but really in small, short windows. So just before a play starts and there are small gaps between the plays of the plays flowing. Um, so really they're kind of calling a play rather than telling them what to do. I will also tell you that sometimes the headsets don't work. It's like a whole other thing with the headsets. But on the whole, on the average, you have to understand that it's actually a very complicated strategic game. And they're just kind of saying, oh, yeah, like, go ahead and make that play. And you'll see the quarterbacks have like this cuff on their, on their thing because there's so many different plays they can call. And they're yelling them, so you have to make sure that they're in code so the other team doesn't know. So I would say, I know the headsets look like cheating, but there's so little they can say. I think it's just the same as effectively yelling from the side. The question is, how well are they paid? So the top guy is a quarterback. The lowest kind of paid guy is probably like your kicker or your punter, that kind of player. So the top paid guy, I think, makes like around $25 million. Um, the guy at the bottom, around 830000 So it depends on whether you're a, a rookie, like coming, just coming out of college, what you get paid with, the, with those contracts. And when they renew your contract, that's when you kind of get the big bucks. Now, Ronaldo, as a comparison, gets paid $49 million. So you can see he's significantly better paid. But the NFL guys are only playing 16 regular season games. So it kind of depends on how you want to look at that. You might say, well, they're wearing pads and they're getting paid that fortune. But I'll tell you, if you have a 320-pound guy running at you, it's going to hurt when he takes you down. And by the way, that 320-pound guy probably runs faster than any of us watching this. So um, it is a tough sport. They are not dumb jocks because that playbook they have to learn is this thick. So are they overpaid, underpaid? I don't know. But that's about the going rate. Now, there is kind of a way to make sure that nobody gets paid like ridiculous money. If you don't think the return of $5 million is ridiculous, but anyway... It would be pretty much impossible to pay a guy 49 million because there's a system in place that's really very odd to me actually but it's about kind of creating some kind of like equity i guess so there's a salary cap so everybody has to spend under a certain amount so therefore you can't pay that guy 49 million because otherwise you really can't have the rest of the team and i think there are 53 players so you have to kind of get all of those guys in there now how do they work out who's paid what and how do you get into the NFL? This bit I think is very interesting because it's completely different. When you're a player and you leave university, you declare for the draft. When you're a proper team, where you finish in the, at the end of the season is your ranking. So the lowest ranked team, so the worst team of the year, gets the top ranked player. At least they have the opportunity. They go to, into the draft with a number one pick. This guy at the top, he's probably the number one pick. They can negotiate with other people to trade him for other people. But ultimately what that means is that guy who comes out of university is the best guy is probably going to the worst team or one of the top five worst teams. Seems a little unfair on the guy, but it's a way to kind of keep the teams a little balanced, which also means that somebody like the Patriots who have won a lot and not been anywhere near the top of that draft picking order are always picking lower in the order so they have to be a little bit smarter about who they take and how because they're never getting the best guys um, out of university though it's hard to know out of university who's going to be a great player in the NFL because they're slightly different and blah 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 so I kind of think that's really interesting and I just mentioned the 25 million guy the quarterback who wins 25 million well his general manager just got fired because they couldn't really build a good enough team around him because they'd spent too much on that guy not necessarily his fault he's gonna take whatever money he can get but not such a great great team decision so that i think is probably one of the most interesting and hard to understand things about um, the nfl and actually it applies to a lot of the sports where you have a draft and all of that kind some of that parity stuff though it's not all exactly the same what do you think about that huh Okay, the next weirdest thing <laughs> of football is this. Teams can move cities. In fact, not cities, states. So, for example, I talked about the Oakland Raiders. They used to be the LA Raiders, but they moved. And then a team called the San Diego Chargers just left San Diego at the end of the season and have gone to LA. So they will be the LA Chargers. So you change the city, you keep the name. But what's really funny about that is Last season, the St. Louis Rams left St. Louis and went to LA and became the LA Rams. So LA went from a team that had nobody to two teams next year. And 
we don't really know if there were any of those teams, to be honest with you, but they did offer to build beautiful stadiums, which those other two cities did not want any part of. So that's really the biggest reason for teams moving. I don't think I've ever heard of a um, team in England moving, but of course, Liverpool moving to another place wouldn't, I mean, they wouldn't be Liverpool anymore because it's just a city. But I just think that that whole, what do you mean they moved city? What about all the millions of fans thing? I just, I struggle to wrap my head around. Oh, and more about the Raiders. Remember, used to be the LA Raiders, have been the Oakland Raiders for years. They want to move to Vegas to become the Vegas Raiders, which I think that kind of crazy and that kind of crazy just belong together. So I really hope that happens. Vegas has never been allowed a team because this is the only place where you can actually go in and bet. So they have a sports book there. So you know how you have like a Labrooks on the high street in the UK, you know, a sports betting place in the UK. Um, they don't have that in the US. You have to be in a gambling city to have a sports book where you can bought, um, bet on sports. So if you're in Vegas, then you can go ahead and bet on pretty much anything, which is why they've never let them have a sporting team because of the mafia and fixing stuff. And that just never seemed like a good idea. But it might be an idea. Who's telling us? Come. The other thing about betting, actually, while I'm there, is the Super Bowl is one of those times where people will pretty much bet on anything. I know in the UK, people will bet on pretty much anything, any time. But one of the things they bet on in the Super Bowl is the length of the song of the national anthem. So some of the singers like to drag it out and some of them sing a shorter version. So there's always bets on how long that song is going to last. And that, my friends, are my fun facts for Super Bowl 51. Oh, but wait, there's one more fun thing that I forgot to mention, and that is tailgating. So tailgating is almost its own sport. Like imagine before you go see, I don't know, West Ham, you're going to go to the pub and have a couple of pints, and then you're going to go to the stadium. Well, in the US, they drive to the stadium hours before the game, and then they just eat, drink, and be merry in the parking lot. Some of those people will eat, drink, and mer be merry before the game and during the game and after the game. They don't actually leave the parking lot to go into the stadium at all. And that's tailgating because they're sitting on the tailgate of their trucks. So I have not gone yet. I'm desperate to go, actually. So if you're watching and you want to invite me to a tailgating party, I am all about it and I would love to come. So thanks very much. That is the end of my Super Bowl 51 and what a British person might want to know about American football. Thanks. Thank you.